Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. All right, welcome back to another segment. And I am honored to, uh, now I'm sitting here looking at her, thank, <laughs> thanks to Zoom, but to be talking with Barry Tesler. Barry probably is known to, to a lot of you. I call her the grandmother of financial therapy. And she doesn't look much like a grandmother, but uh, nevertheless, she is the. It, it, it was from Barry that I first heard the the term financial therapy. And anyway, Barry, I, uh, welcome. You are the very first, if we want to call it an interview conversation I've ever had on this podcast, because most of the time they get to listen to me. Hi, Rick. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, and I'm very honored to be your first guest. And it's very funny that you're calling me the grandma, but, you know, I'm in my 50s. So, you know, I do have friends. Well, I have a 13-year-old son. I have friends that are grandmas at my age. So, right? Yeah. Um, I, I liked, you know, I've been saying the word one of the pioneers, a leader, you know, and then you called me grandma. So, you know, it all works. <laughs> you it can put that works. on the resume. <laughs> exactly. The grandma of financial therapy. Well, you are a pioneer of financial therapy. There, there is no question about that. I remember, I think this is the first time I met you. Was that a, a Naz Rudin gathering at Estes Park? Does that sound right? Oh, yes. 17 or so years ago. Yeah. And I remember it because you did a cartwheel to introduce yourself. <laughs> is my memory right? Yes, that is true. <laughs> I, it was a very big circle and we were going around and saying hello. And I've never done that before. I just got the impulse to do a cartwheel <laughs> in the middle of the circle. And, and as a way of saying hello, introducing myself, I was, yeah, I was in my young 30s and uh yeah lots of energy <laughs> back then yes well i think still a lot of energy i don't know if you're doing cartwheels anymore you know i did one last year at my son's soccer game they were having a really great game and a second or third goal was made and i did do a cartwheel on the sidelines so yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's known to still happen occasionally. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that that still happens. So I think from, from that, I learned of your work. It, refresh me, where were you in your career about that time? Do you remember? Yes, of course. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's see. I had spent my 20s getting my master's in somatic psychology at Nairobi University, right? And right. It's an important piece to name, right? Before I get to my 30s and where we meet in that moment. So that was my entire 20s was, you know, working in the mental health field, working in hospice. I really thought my topics were going to be intimacy, sexuality, body, food, grief, death, all of those great topics, you know, and then my student loan came due and then I freaked out and then I realized my entire graduate program never talked about money ever. You know, we didn't have any discussions. We didn't have any training on how to work with couples or how to work with, you know, our own money emotions or how to start a practice and do the bookkeeping and on and on, you know. So there was a period of time between the ages for me of 28 to 32, where I took this detour. And that's when I learned everything I could about bookkeeping and beginning money management and was doing my own money work. And then, you know, I, you know, I had a whole 
bookkeeping business during that time where I was working with other therapists and coaches and artists, and they just threw their books at me. They had no idea I had a master's in psychology. They had they didn't want to have anything to do with their bookkeeping. And, you know, and I took it over and I always say I learned more about money patterns and spending patterns and income patterns, you know, the whole thing, you know, by doing people's books and really seeing what was going on and talking with them. And so you, and so I'm getting to when we met. So at 32 is when there was a moment I was asked to teach by a mentor And I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to teach about. And she said, well, it's time for you to teach, you know, young lady. And I went out in the woods and I just started asking questions. You know, what can I bring back to my community? How can I help people have a healthy, savvy, conscious relationship to money and so on? Came out of the woods. We were, I was living with my husband in a tiny cabin, maybe 350 square feet in the redwoods of California. He got out the white paper and we just started throwing up, you know, ideas. And I came up with my initial three phases of my methodology that I've been teaching now for over 20 years. But back then it was financial therapy. It was values-based bookkeeping and life visioning, something, you know, something like that. Right. And but it was my husband who came up with the term financial therapy. Mm-hmm. So I need to give credit where credit is due. He, you know, saw the work that I had done for years, getting the degree, the training, working in the field, then all of this, these new budding money management skills. And I, I, I fell in love with bookkeeping. And it really, for me, blew me away as more of a experiential, creative dancer, you know, type of person. And then just to complete to where we met, I, you know, came up with those three phases, came up with this initial methodology, taught that first little workshop or presentation, and then just started teaching in 10 person groups over and over and over and over, you know? And so you and I met just a couple of years into that journey where I was still in California. Now I was living on an apple orchard you know, where people had to drive in and tractors and they would come to my home and in my living room, there'd be 10 people. And I was teaching my, you know, financial therapy, values-based bookkeeping, life vision planning, you know, three different phases over six weeks, which seems so silly to me. You know, now it's a year long program. It needs, you know, it takes a minimum of a year to really go through. So that's, we met when I was just in the first few years of teaching those tiny little in-person groups over and over and over everywhere I could in the Bay Area of California. And then I met, I had a connection through my husband to Dick Wagner. Oh, sure. Dick Wagner invited me to come to Nesrudin and meet all of you and do, you know, we're, and then the cartwheel in the circle. And I, I was asked to do a presentation too. It was, and I was so welcomed, you know, I was young. I was, you know, it, um, and I just, it was, it was a wonderful experience for me. Yeah. And I remember you did one of those small group presentations for me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And maybe a few clients, I kind of forget. Yes. Tiny group of seven, eight people. Yeah. Yes. And Ted Klontz was there, right? Yes. He was in the room. And that, so all that was back like in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002. No, I started my work in financial therapy methodology in 2001. So you and I met 2004. Oh, okay. So it was, you know, 2004, 2005, okay. 2006, that time. Yes. <clears throat> yep. That was the time that that I started working with Ted around what is this thing, money and emotion, and is there any intersection? Yes, that's when you started working together. And also, I mean, you the Nazarene was the first crew of financial planners that I was so excited by and interested and intrigued in. You were the first ones, you may have been the first to bring a fi- to bring a therapist into the room of your financial planning sessions. And it, you know, I just got, oh, these are my people. These are, you know, these are my people. Yeah. So just one thing that so hits me is I run around with a lot of therapists these days <laughs> and money skills are not inherently part of the typical 
therapist toolbox. Yes. And just to to honor and bring out to to any um, super left brain planners that may be listening to this, that that comes very natural to them. This is not this is not normal, Barry. <laughs> well, it's not, you mean it's not normal? It's not that I... normal to, to be a somatic therapist. Yeah. And right. start a bookkeeping business. Right, right. Well, I mean, you know, for me, when that student loan came due, it was, I'm either, you know, it was a fight, flight, freeze, everything moment. You know, I'm either going to run away and never face this or, OK, after a moment of considering my options, I'm going to face it just like I do any other big, scary topic, you know, that I've taken on in my life, you know, over the years. Like, I'm, I'm going to face it. And I mean, the other key point was that when I was in the mental health field, working 40 hours a week in the milieu, I was offered five hours a week in a back room and that they would teach me Quicken and Excel. And I don't even know why they asked me because everything you mentioned, you know, but some voice in me said, just say yes, just say yes, you know? And so I was taught Quicken and Excel and it literally like blew my brain cells away, you know, to learn it and to be able to understand it. I felt so extremely empowered by it and it blew my mind. And then someone taught me QuickBooks. And I always say like, I learned QuickBooks by, you know, having breaks of chocolate and, (laughs) and, you know, and crying in chocolate breaks, you know, when I finally started doing it for myself and whenever I was training and then I started training people on how to do it. And I, I think if you, I always say with, any of the creative folks, you just need time. You need patience. You need a really good teacher and you need chocolate and you need, you know, a box of tissue. Like you, you just need breaks to feel your feelings. Exact. Lily's is a good one. I, I, I'm showing her my Lily sea salt, extra dark chocolate bar. It's on his desk. Exactly. Very taught, taught me that this is an important component to be a good financial therapist. It is. It is. I, you know, I used to show up with chocolate bars when I used to teach and I didn't get them out when we were in the financial therapy part of it. But as soon as we hit the bookkeeping, I got the chocolate out just to take the edge off. I was like, okay, in our therapy sessions, we're we're probably not going to have chocolate. I'm probably not going to be giving people sugar. Although Lily's is no sugar. So anyway, just to complete that. Yeah. It really surprised me. It was incredibly empowering and I, you know, I get a lot of people to fall in love with the system, but they, you know, it takes six months to a year before you really feel comfortable and confident and all that. But it was so a huge piece of my own journey because, you know, I tell the story a lot. And in my book, in graduate school, the bank statements would come and I just threw them away because yeah. what do you do with them? You know, there was just no relationship there at all. And I didn't want to look and, you know, all this stuff. So I've been there and that's part of how I can help a lot of creatives. And I don't just get creatives, but usually people are coming to me because they want a non-traditional approach, right? They, they, they've they heard all the live within your means, you know, don't have debt, live with, you know, just get a budget, you know, they, and that's all stuff is good and fine. Right. But as we know, there's so much more going on. And so, you know, it's not just creatives who are coming to me, but they're a big crew. Yeah. You know, I just had this thought, Barry, I tribute some of my success in bringing the financial therapy or the life planning message to financial planners, because I have this wonderfully developed left brain and my message to them is I've, it took me $80,000 in 12 years to find out that I had a right brain, but it's possible. And I never thought of this with, with you going just the opposite. Yes. Of, of starting with the creatives. And what I just heard you say is your part of your message is you can do the left brain stuff. You can do this financial stuff. I did it. it you can too. Fun. Right. You can do it with support, with 
slowing down, with learning how to listen to your body. I mean, the somatic piece is a huge part of, you know, my particular financial therapy work as well. So that's, that's huge. But yes, I came from the other side as you certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And and the body is a huge part. I would have pushed back on that 15, 20 years ago. (laughs) I didn't even know I had a body. (laughs) I remember my coach, Tracy Beckus. I don't know if you've ever met Tracy. She, oh yeah, you've I've heard her mentioned many over the years, so I remember that name. Yes. Yeah, I was forty-four years old, and she. I remember her saying, "So, so where in your body do you feel that?" And I was like, "Tracy, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Where in my body am I feeling that?" And uh, mm-hmm. th- then she said something. She says, "Well, Rick, every feeling starts as a sensation in your body." Mm. Like, well, that's a load of garbage, (laughs) which it wasn't. (laughs) Tracy, in my brain. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Mm. it's so connected with that. You know, the the other part uh, that I have always admired you, in addition to everything else you've just said, is your marketing. I love your little notes when you send them to me when you're like, that was so good. or I love that one. Or, you know, I mean, oh God, you know, I, I go in and out of loving and hating marketing. Right. <laughs> so even, you know, when I was first starting a business, it was just antithetical to everything. You know, it was, we weren't supposed to want money, strive for money, think about money, talk about money, you know, as a therapist, And then I was also, you know, at Naropa University, which is a Buddhist school, Buddhist based school. So while I'm not Buddhist, you know, they bring a lot of Eastern teachings right into the structure, how they teach all of it. So there's a whole spiritual community. And then that just continued. We're not supposed to strive for money, talk about money. Right. So there was all of there were so many messages that I had to unravel um, because I did not know how to create a livelihood right? Where I was doing work that I loved and was able to bring all my skill sets and was able to make a nice living because, you know, back in the day working in the mental health field, I was making $11 an hour and, and then got the master's degree and I didn't get bumped up. I didn't get that. I didn't have enough points to get bumped up to $12 an hour. You know, I just (laughs) remember being, okay, am I going to become an activist and, and, and get the world to understand how valuable mental health, social workers, counselors, caregivers, overnight care. I was doing all the, you know, caregiving stuff that I could. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's not valued in the marketplace. It still isn't, right? Am I going to go that route? Or am I going to learn how to make more money by doing what I do? Mm -hmm. And I chose that path. And... you know, there was an impetus of, I need to get some self-care and I can't on $11 an hour and I'm giving so much, or I want to bring a basket full of chocolate, you know, to dinner and I can't, you know? So those were like the beginning things that led me to, all right, I have to learn all of this. And so I've just been on a journey for the last 20 years, learning marketing and, you know, and, and I, I, you know, it's interesting. I always appreciate your notes because I can look at so many colleagues and think, you know, of course, in moments, I do a comparison of their way down the road, they're ahead of me. But at the end of the day, you know that two things. One, and this leads back to how I do marketing, is I'm always trying to create my life and work around this equation, you know, in no particular order, money, energy, time, family, and health. And I started adding giving into that as a sixth piece. Mm-hmm. And so I'm always making any life and money decisions based on that. And so when I get into a comparison moment, I just come back to what life phase am I in? What's going on with my family? What do they need? What do I, what's going on with the health, you know, and on and on and on in creating a business model, services, a structure around that. And then the marketing is just, you know, how do I, how am I visible? How do I say hello in the world? How do I say Hey, this is what I'm offering. 
And how do I do it in fun, creative ways and meaningful ways? And so there are years where I write my newsletters. There are years where I have a co-writer. I've had excellent co-writing help where I'll create an outline and then they'll write, they'll sew it all together and create a piece. Or I'll say, oh, listen to this Q&A from one of my community calls for my program, you know, send them the clip and then they'll create a piece around it. So I've been co-collaborating around writing for years and years and years because it's, I can talk and talk and talk and teach and create worksheets and create ideas and create, con- you know, it's like, you know, I, I love the actual teaching and facilitation and working, you know, teaching my groups and, or doing the private financial therapy, which I didn't do for five years. And I opened up my slots again this year and, that's been fun, right? Um, and the marketing of that is I haven't opened them up in five years and here I'm opening them up, you know, and I here are 25 slots and they, you know, they sell out in two hours where years ago, they did not sell out in two hours. It took right. weeks for me to fill five or, you know, so I'm always just looking for creative, meaningful ways. And I've had, and I have great support where I have writers with me. So it's an ongoing process and journey of, you know, how, how much do I want to be visible? I like a lot of private, quiet, alone time. And how do I do this? You know, I, I, I think my, I think I'm okay with marketing, but I love your feedback that I'm fabulous with it. <laughs> you know, you know, what stands out to me again is marketing themselves. It's not something that, that comes naturally to a lot of therapists, to a lot of creatives, right? Yes. So you've got the financial skills that that also don't come naturally. You stretched yourself to learn that. And then you put yourself into the to the marketing space. And I think what is so impressive to me is there's there has to be a lot of emotional work done. To, for you to have gotten into that space, right? It, 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 to, to put yourself out there. Well, yeah. I mean, I, my, my graduate training at Naropa in my 20s, I always say saved me. It saved me. It got me through my 20s into the rest of my life. You know, at Naropa, we had to do our own work. Right. So we had to go to therapy, individual therapy, group therapy. There was it was totally experiential. You know, there was we were doing experiential training and facilitation day in and day out. So I was, you know, 24 to 28 years old. I got to completely be in a really deep process through those years. And and I just want to point out that's unusual for a therapy uh, therapy master's program. It is. And, you know, I had gone to a traditional undergrad. I went to University of Wisconsin at Madison, got the history degree, didn't know what I was going to do. You know, really, I, I'm a late bloomer, whatever that means. We're all in our different time frames. We all hit marks, different you know, milestones, different time points in our lives. And, you know, I'm just in and maybe I shouldn't even say late bloomer where we all have our different pacing. But I really finished that undergrad still having no clue what I wanted to do when I grew up, you know, but I also always tell the story that I grew up and I either wanted to be a solid gold dancer. Number one, do you know that TV show? No. Okay. You don't. So let's see. You're so much younger than I am. Okay. So it was my, (laughs) yeah, it was my age group is great dancers on TV and I grew up dancing. So either solid gold dancer or my seventh grade report was on being a businesswoman. My father was in business and real estate, right? So, or wanted to be a businesswoman, didn't know what kind. Then third, I asked my parents if I could go to a therapy when I was 16. So yes, I was having a good old time, partying, having, being a teenager, a lot of angst, a lot of sadness, normal stuff. And I just wanted to understand myself better. And I mean, and then unfortunately I went to a male therapist and I just kind of plain played mind games because it was just talk therapy and didn't really work. Even though I asked to go, I really then played games instead of going deeper. And so for me, when I finally heard about movement therapy and somatic therapy, 
I, you know, that's when, I mean, I took a, a break between undergrad and what was next. And I went to live in Israel for a year and I was running, do, jogging every day on a kibbutz and I had an epiphany. I'm going to put together, you know, uh, therapy, therapy, because I was so interested in psychology, a lot of my, right, my, my history and psychology classes with dance. I thought I made up a whole field, you know, it, oh, on so cool. in his, yeah. And so then I heard that there were graduate programs and I heard about Naropa. It's the, it was the only fit for me. I was done with traditional. I was done. I'm not a theoretical person. I don't have a bone in my body that's theoretical, even though I do, you know, I go to listen to your stuff and bread clans and I go and I, you know, listen to other research. But recently I interviewed Brad Klontz and he said to me, you know, all the conclusions you've come to, I've come to the same ones in my research. You've just come to them, you know, through working with people directly, you know, which was was really honoring and really nice. So to complete this story is that, you know, Naropa is unique. It's not a traditional psychotherapy or counseling program. You really have to get in there and do your own work and learn how to facilitate on a deep, deep, deep intuitive level. Of course, with lots of skills, I had great somatic teachers, but learning how to listen to my body as a 20 year old something woman and learning how to recognize where the sensations were, how they were going to turning into impulses and then movement or sound or emotions, you know, learning that terrain was essential life skills for me, you know, that have served me in everything that I've done in my life and were the very first pieces that when I realized that I was being asked to create some kind of money methodology, or I took that, uh, I took that mission on step one was I'm bringing the body check in step. And I didn't even know what I was doing back then, but it was step one, bring in the body check in. Because I think the very first class that I taught the very first night, I said, okay, let's talk about our money history. Let's talk about our childhoods, you know? And they like, everyone just like shut down, freaked out. Some people shared, it was too much too soon. And so I, you know, every time I taught a class, I realized what I was missing, what I left out, what I needed to add in. And, but the body check-in came in, you know, right from the beginning, we're going to bring those tools and how to slow down, how to get out of our heads, how to listen to our body, how to start to learn sensations, emotions, which leads to money stories, which you call money scripts, right? That, that was that step one for me always. Yeah. Totally. Barry, you are fascinating. And um, we just have a, just a few seconds left. Let everybody know where they can find you, a little bit about your book. Yeah. So I have a great website, barrytesler.com. And my first book, The Art of Money, A Life-Changing Guide to Financial Happiness, came out in 2016. Hardback, paperback, audiobook, all of it. You can get that everywhere and anywhere. And then my second book, I don't know if you know this, Rick. I know it. I, is, <laughs> is, in the works. Is it, well, it's being published May. So it's in pre-orders now. Super. It's being published in May. And it's a, it's a workbook that is a wonderful companion to my first book. It stands alone. It's 176 pages where my first book is 300 pages of more of my stories and methodology. So it's robust. We thought it'd be a little journal with quotes and it's not because, you know, women, you've been doing it for this long. So those, those are the two books that you can get. And I have a podcast, The Art of Money, a great blog, a year long program, The Art of Money, where we go through, you know, my methodology with great content and support and all of that. So, and then come find me on Instagram. Or Facebook. <laughs> or get get on the emails and you get these wonderful marketing email letters. Barry, thanks so much for being with me and uh, wishing you the very best in going forward. You too, Rick. It's such an, a pleasure to have had our friendship for 17 plus years and may continue and 
Thank you so much for having me as your first guest. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.